this morning we're going to talk about on, on life and the law. We're going to talk about uh, lawyers defending American democracy with two lawyers who are both involved. One, Scott Hoshberger, who joins us from what, Boston? Uh, and G my brother, Gene Fidel, who joins us from New Haven. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. It's great to be here. So, Scott, let's start with you. Can you talk about the origins and mission of Lawyers Defending American Democracy, to call it LDAD? Uh, the uh, origin of, uh, of Lawyers Defending American Democracy was uh, a discussion that many of us had in our Harvard Law School reunion uh, last fall, in which uh, uh, consistently we identified the major concern that we had, which was that the President of the United States appeared to be intentionally and systematically uh, making every effort to undermine the rule of law and in a variety of ways, attacks on the press, attacks on judiciary, attacks on the Justice Department, law enforcement, a variety of other actions undertaking to uh, undermine the norms, the core principles, the norms of, uh, of our democracy, including particularly major legal principles. Uh, we talked about that. And what we realized was that while there are many people uh, uh, pushing back, uh, uh, most of it was partisan, it was viewed as politics, it was viewed as partisan attacks, or one way or the other. And we felt that our profession, the profession that we all have spent over 50 years in, was the silence of our profession was deafening. Here we are, independent, nonpartisan profession, charged with upholding the core tenets of our legal system and constitutional system and the organized bar, deans of law schools, leaders of, uh, of law firms, and many, many others were simply silent and to some extent acquiescing uh, in this, what appeared to us to be, uh, or sort of systematic and intentional effort to erode and corrode the core principles of our democracy. And we felt that we should try to do something. And that's what led to our statement of principles, our open letter, uh, which identified five major principles that we felt were fundamental to American democracy, uh, independence of the media, independence of the judiciary, truthfulness of public officials, uh, the independence of federal criminal justice agencies and others, as well as civil discourse and fair treatment uh, and respect for uh, for each other. And that, that started it. We then have we began to try to attract other lawyers, and so here we are several months in, and we have uh, uh, managed to have over 400 uh, prominent uh, lawyers from around the country uh, sign our open letter, uh, and we continue to reach out and try one by one to get more and more lawyers to join us. But then, as Gene will tell you, one of the major goals is how do we mobilize the legal profession? Where is this profession that we have all spent our careers in? Why are we so silent when the core principles of our profession are under attack and no one is defending them in a nonpartisan, nonpolitical way? Yes, Gene, why is that? And how do you uh, motivate people? Well, uh, I think that, that you know, this, this whole exercise is quite interesting, not only for the reasons that uh, Scott Harshbarger gave, but also because it's a window on the evolution of the American bar. Uh, we have a lot of bar associations, bar organizations, every, you know, shape and description, but uh, they, in many instances, are so encrusted with procedural, you know, uh, requirements uh, that, that they, they become tongue-tied, or they're so invested in, you know, the things that are already on their plate. They don't have any energy left to dedicate to the kind of crisis that uh, we're facing for the reasons that Scott uh, gave. Um, this is not the fault of the, uh, uh, the bar leaders. The bar leaders do the best they can with what they have. But I think one of the things that uh, the lawyers defending American democracy can do is try to light a fire under some of our bar leaders. These are our friends and our colleagues. Sometimes they're our, our law partners. Uh, to try to light a fire under them. Uh, because as an institution, the bar has some special credibility. The bar is not partisan. You know, the, you, you don't have Republican 
uh, admission to the bar and Democratic admission to the bar or Green Party admission to the bar, you just get admitted to the bar. You practice law. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that the bar represents the uh, custodian of our legal tradition and our legal norm, it's up to us to uh, stick up for those norms and to be vocal. I mean, God knows one of the things you learn in law school is how to use your vocal cords in your pen. That's about <laughs> it. Maybe your maybe your mind also. Uh, but you know, we we do have some credibility as a group. Now, like, the one thing I want to say is this is it's very easy for observers to react to something like this and say, "Well, this is all you know the, the partisans." And you're just trying by other means to uh, hammer President Trump. That's absolutely not the case. This, this is a, a nonpartisan effort. And what we're appealing to is not any particular set of social objectives or political objectives. It has to do with these neutral principles of the role of law in a democratic society. And we have, we have members of both parties actively involved in the uh, leadership of the organization. Jay, I think I just, let me echo just on that what sure. Gene is saying, because I think one of the, the, the questions here is, what, is this really sort of a, a, a separate partisan effort? And I think Gene's being very kind to the organized bar and the leaders of our bar session, when I think, in fact, a great deal is, is driven by now economic interest, the corporatization, if you will, of law firms, uh, the concerns about not being attacked. Uh, for uh, against their client interests, uh, a lot of silence here is partly a result of political techniques. But the other side of it is that we accept that elections have consequences, and but, but the only ideological piece here is if, if you believe that fair and equal justice, independence of judiciary, uh, a strong, a free press, uh, civility. Uh, core elements of democracy are ideological. We have a major problem in this country. And this is where, as Gene says, this has been the role traditionally of the bar. I mean, while we're, many will not remember this, uh, when we were coming out of law school in the early public interest days of the 70s, uh, the Nixon White House, the Vietnam War, uh, the Lord lawyers as a group, not as Republican lawyers or Democratic lawyers, uh, but as Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, uh, various lawyer, legal groups who stood up uh, for the Boston Bar Association, deal with Boston school desegregation, supporting the federal court order, uh, and the Saturday Night Massacre when Archibald Cox was being removed. The bar stood up and said, this shall not stand. That is, we are going to establish that there is a center here. And now we're similar. We're coming up to law day, May 1. And we just had this remarkable report from, from, from Bob Mueller, who of all people is the most independent, nonpartisan person I've ever known, who, while being vilified for two years, produces what by any standard is a comprehensive but fair judgment and report uh, on the activity of the president and his enablers, uh, and being attacked as partisan and yes, there are Democrats supporting it. Yes, there are or protect smaller organizations, lawyers for good government supporting it. But where is the organized bar to say, hold it? This is a report that is the independent counsel. It needs to be considered not by Republicans or Democrats, but by members of the bar about the question of whether we have a corrupt or not corrupt administration and are these allegations true, whether they're criminal or not. So the timing now is that we need a center. One of the great concerns that uh, played out, has played out repeatedly has been the WB Yates line about Vietnam in 1968 is, you know, the center shall not hold, things fall apart. So what is Gene is talking about is an effort to try to mobilize the center to make sure that there's a debate and not just a series of partisan attacks back and forth with facts uh, depending on what, which side you're on. And that's why I think it's so important to try to find a way to mobilize the legal profession uh, as independent, 
protectors and defenders, if you will, of democracy. Well, you know, um, yeah. th there are various factors that have held the bar back from uh, exercising its duty and its power to preserve the rule of law. Uh, those factors may be very hard to change. Um, and I wonder, you know, how you see the effort to change those factors and to uh, mobilize, as you say, mobilize the bar to take affirmative action on this issue uh, when they have not, as you said, uh, really done that so far, even though it's we're two years into this administration, two years into these attacks on, um, on the rule of law and, for that matter, the Constitution. Um, so how do, you, how do you step forward? It's not just that you can speak and write because you went to law school. It's what do you do with the speaking and writing? What are you asking the signatories to this letter to do? Well, the first thing we want is that uh, lawyers, and it's a lawyer's letter, by the way. This is not to uh, denigrate people who uh, haven't had the opportunity and fun of, uh, it's fun of going to law school. Um, but it, it's a lawyer's letter. And what we want is for as many of our uh, fellow members of the bar, including uh, people who teach, people who have been law school deans, uh, we have many former judges, sitting judges obviously can't sign a letter like this, but we have many former judges who have been very offended by some of the things that have happened uh, over the last year and a half or so. So what we need as step one is for people in that, that meet that description to get busy and to focus on this, not simply as the partisan, you know, passing partisan outrage of the day, uh, the, the news on whatever is your channel of choice, but actually to consider the institutional implications for our society. And let me, uh, I want to say one thing here. Uh, there are parts of our political system, our democracy, I don't mean politics, you know, in the partisan sense, but in our democracy that are not in the Constitution. Uh, one is the bar. It doesn't have any constitutional standing. Another is the media. Of course, the media at least get uh, protected by the First Amendment. But you're seeing uh, two important institutions that have eroded over the last number of decades. And it's, it's only in the last few years, actually. Look at what's happened to newsrooms around the country. Newsroom budgets are shrinking. Uh, there's a consolidation of ownership. Uh, the smaller newspapers are folding. Like every other day, we hear about another uh, hometown paper that's collapsed, and it's vanished from the screen. This is not to take away anything from the vibrant, you know, online uh, uh, news media, but the fact is that uh, news budgets have been slashed, and what is often delivered online or streaming television and cable is more politics than actual news and analysis. So that's, that's where the, the media are concerned. And the, the other side of that sandwich, so to speak, is the bar. The bar uh, membership in the American Bar Association is down, even though the number of lawyers, I believe, is up. Uh, the organizations go through phases of uh, activity or greater or lesser activity. We're probably seeing a, a time where for a host of reasons, uh, such as, you know, uh, trying to drum up additional business to tend to the needs of your clients, uh, make as good a living as you can, where the attentions of many private practitioners may be focused on things other than pro bono matters. Now, I, w I do want to add one footnote, and that is, uh, even though uh, it's critical that the bar as such and I want to I want to see the president of the American Bar Association on television rather than Scott Hansen's face or my face or Jay even your face. We need to see and hear from the presidents of the bars, and that hasn't really happened yet. Uh, so we have some real work to do, and I, I don't uh, really disagree with Scott's uh, comment about what it was like. Uh, two generations ago, uh, time, time flies. But, you know, during the Nixon crisis, uh, the bar did stand up. But during, during desegregation, the bar did stand up. During the fight against Senator uh, Joseph McCarthy, it was time so the bar did stand up. Where is the bar now? I don't know that the 70s and 60s and 50s were such a golden age, but all I know is we need to do something now. This is the age we're living in. The country really is in a crisis where it's 
the notions of objective truth, which is what we strive for in the legal system, are themselves under attack or where an entire federal judicial circuit gets uh, treated as a disgrace, described as a disgrace by the President of the United States. And I'm talking about what President Trump said about the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, or calling some sitting federal judge a so-called judge. I mean, this is ridiculous. And if lawyers don't stand up and use their vocal cords, uh, we're in a hell of a pickle. Well, I remember keen to say that uh, you know, you're raising the question that raises our temperatures, but what has surprised me, I will confess on this, is I said both as a former attorney general, as, as somebody who's been very active in the public sector and, and in all these areas, what has disturbed me most about the last uh, period of time has been the increasing partisanship and polarization, the lack of any sort of common uh, understanding. It was one thing that have facts about which you could have agree, you know, disagree without being disagreeable on different policy positions. But at this point, we're even dealing with core principles about which people debate whether they are core principles or not. You have a president, and let me be clear, I find President Trump to be shameless, to be a liar, to be all these things. But he did win the election, whether rightly or wrongly, he won it. Elections have consequences. But what I am amazed about is that he has figured out that being, you know, the boundaries and limits and civility and common decency are no longer required of the President of the United States. And that tone at the top, like any tone at the top of any leadership of any organization we've ever dealt with, with a law firm, a law school, a corporation, the tone at the top makes a huge difference in how people treat each other, even when they disagree. And we are clearly a fractured society. And what I think that we, I, I am concerned about, the next people who do not recall this history, is that we are, that we are, do not understand how fragile, potentially, these institutions are. They depend hugely on trust, on confidence. And the people believing that government, whether large or small, matters, the integrity, and these kinds of core principles, while often violated, are not flaunted as success. That is, if you're now, you know, that being shameless is almost a success. Now, that's not the only President Trump. He just happens to be a very sophisticated symbol of this and using it well. What I'm trying to figure out is, where did we, as a legal profession, uh, lose our way? Gene is making an excellent point, is that whatever else the bar has been, usually in practice, like not conservative, cautious, protecting institutions, much more than disrupting them, making sure that traditions and legacy are held as we often, you know, as reformers try to fight against that. Now... The bar has almost retreated from the fray completely, mm. uh, except for their own self-interests are at stake, or the clients of their of their clients' interests are at stake. That's the actual erosion of this institution. That is a great concern. And the thing I, I know we're taking a lot of time here, but here's what surprises me is how many people I talk to, and Gene has done a wonderful thing by having this this simple handing out business card. How many people I talk to agree with us, but see nothing, there's nothing they can do about it. They either think it doesn't matter, you're crazy, it's quixotic, you know, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to litigate, you're not going to go in the street, uh, it, it, it's almost hopeless, that, or it doesn't affect me, it's this apathy, this staying on the sidelines that we're trying to create, at least engage in the yeah. process yeah. and see what we can do. Yeah, I mean, we have, we have huge complacency, not only among the bar, but among the public, I think. Um, and uh, people, people are, they don't feel empowered to, to, to change things. Uh, they watch the, the line, the new normal increase. They are more outraged um, and less, uh, less, less uh, empowered. So I ask you this, Scott, you know, visiting Dickens on the ghost of Christmas future, if we do nothing, what happens to this country? 
Well, I think, uh, look, I, I don't, this is still America, this is the hard part. This, for all of our issues, we still are a very prosperous economy. We still have vibrant institutions. We still have freedom of speech. We still have all the values that people around the world look to. Uh, and yes, our imperfections are clear, uh, whether it's race or hate or things of that type. Um, so we still have an opportunity, but this illusion that this can just keep going on. I go back to the, 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 the WB8 quote here, which was that if you look back to 1968, I think in the Ken Burns series that he did on Vietnam, uh, the 68, the theme was things fall apart, the center will not hold. And that was actually a statement, I guess, that Bobby Kennedy uh, used to reference as a way to call us to understand that, that we need to hold the center. And I, I see the issue uh, today, for example, even in our elected politics. I mean, can you be elected for, among Democrats? Is it possible to be a moderate centrist and have a chance to get by a primary? Uh, or is it, do you have to take extreme positions and is being in the middle and trying to hold the center and the institutions uh, 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 possible. So I, I think that, that this is where what we have, we need to figure out if we ever have the chance to make the case possibly for why it is important that these core principles uh, and the institutions that implement them, mm -hmm. uh, for all its issues, the Department of Justice used to always pretty much stand or making decisions on the facts and the law. Yes, policies, but not partisanship, yes. not politics, yes. not reaching out, not having a president of the United States demand that an attorney general serve as his or her attorney as opposed to being independent. They may still have been partisan, but there was always at least a facade that were independent. And the same thing, you know, with 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 uh, the, the law enforcement agencies. The same thing with the press. Uh, for all its position, we're now clearly divided. In that I think, I think this polarization is not only President Trump. But if we stay silent, uh, I hate to refer back to what I've heard many people talk about in the mid '30s in Germany. I mean, do you, do you just wait for this to happen and assume it will not happen? How do we get young people to understand the dramatic problems that we face when we, as the adults, Will not stand up and deliver. Well, Gene, what you know? What about yeah. just waiting? What about just waiting uh, until the next election and uh, suffering through well, it? We don't. We don't have that luxury. Uh, we really don't have that luxury. But I want to add one point, um, so that you know, viewers not feel that Scott and I are about to throw ourselves off the balcony <laughs> because. There are some, there are some are quite positive developments, and I, you know, they need to be mentioned. Uh, even though Scott and I uh, and our uh, friends and lawyers defending American democracy uh, feel that some, you know, real energetic work has to be done, energetic work is being done, uh, but it's right. not being done by the bar as such. It's being done by law school clinics. Uh, which has done yeoman service, heroic service. These kids, their kids, right? They get the books. They have to work through the night representing people who, uh, you know, when the, the uh, Muslim ban uh, was the executive order from uh, President Trump was being litigated, uh, they worked through the nights. They just showed up at, uh, at the airport. We will. I, I haven't forgotten those pictures. I don't think either of you has uh, either. Uh, these, when you look at the uh, amount and breadth of uh, litigation uh, that uh, lawyers uh, from law firms and from clinics and law professors uh, have engaged in, it is a, really a, a tremendous achievement for lawyers. But it is not an achievement for the bar. And that's the myth piece that I think is critical, and that's why we're here. And I, I know I speak for myself. I'm always happy to be on your show, Jay, but I think it's, it's uh, important that 
people hear from people like Scott Harshbarger. He, he won't to his own horn, so I will. Scott was the Attorney General of Massachusetts for a while. Uh, he was the head of the uh, Common Cause for a while. He's a public spirited a person that I've ever known. And we need the Scott Harshbarger's uh, to come forward. We need the bar presidents, uh, the president of the Hawaii State Bar, uh, the California State Bar, any bar that is in a position legally to take a position on things ought to be taking a position in that in their name, in their corporate name. That, that can't be done everywhere. It can't be done in jurisdictions that have a uh, what's called an integrated bar where it's a public agency, basically. But that's that's not the entire country, and it's certainly not the American Bar Association. Yeah. I'm at Gene's point, Jay, is it, that, there, that, that, that the hope that I see uh, here is, is actually, uh, like, so many things coming from uh, the younger generations in terms of their their commitment, but I think that they also need various kinds of role models. And if they look now, the role models are not coming from the organized bar, uh, and maybe that's somewhat inevitable. But they're coming from uh, leading advocates on both sides. I mean, whether it's the uh, uh, federal society, uh, which has been active and very very successful, or on the other side that the sort of more the ACLU and other kinds of activities, but they're, but the problem is that they're siloed. They're not relating to the broader issues of the common causes, in the words of John Gardner, the common causes. What is it that binds us all together that we may have different views about, but that we can agree upon um, that we need? And, th and this is where I think the... The bar associations, and I would even say, I think the law schools, Gene has made some one point that I think that we're, we're, we're ducking a little bit, which is that we happen to have, and I think a very prominent law schools where there are some deans that have stepped up here, but by and large, most deans of law school today feel exactly like managing partners of law firms. They don't dare offend anyone, and therefore, they will not take direct positions in terms of issues such as this, which are not partisan. That is, they do not believe that they may stand for the rule of law, but they're not going to criticize the President of the United States or a leading official who may do something that would be deemed a violation of the rule of law. I mean, they're, they're, that's just not part of the job description. In fact, the job description is, you know, avoid that kind of controversy, support you know, civil discourse and that kind of thing, but don't take a position on anything that is facing us right now. And right now, I think in this country, uh, the, the, the Mueller report, for example, in, in my experience and lifetime, is not whether there should be impeachment, but whether there should be a full discussion of reading a report in which the President of the United States boldly Unless, of course, now he says they lie, and he doesn't lie, uh, only have made every effort to interfere with a, you know, what now is he's trying to even deem as an illegal investigation. That is, to challenge the very core things, just as Gene said, they're Obama judges, not real judges. You know, the press is all fake news, unless they agree with me. The Mueller report is, 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 atrocious, except that it exonerates me. So believe that part, but don't believe the part about where I lied. In other words, there is, a, there is nothing that sort of people look at and say, you know, what are the facts here? How do, what does it mean in terms of our policies? And what I am concerned about is you just said, wait till 2020. Well, if we wait for the politics of this, and, we, and elections do matter, uh, the question is, Will enough people vote, or will they think it won't? Will they not participate actively in that engagement, or will it be a highly polarized, ideological election uh, that, that drives away independent people who don't want to be involved? I, I'm not sure that I have the kind of totally positive in there that we can just wait till 2020, because I think that right now we are being challenged on any number of levels that I think leaders of the bar. If the bar is to play a role, and I just take everybody back to the Tocqueville, who well, did look to the law and legal institutions as being one of the core principles 
of democracy in America. Absolutely. So my question to both of you to close is, um, you know, you talked about uh, writing a letter, reaching 400 people, looking, for, looking to reach many other people. There are millions of lawyers in this country who are potential recipients and signatories to this letter. What role does lawyers defending American democracy see for itself in being a leader and being a magnet and being, um, you know, a center of the discussion going forward? Or are you leaving it to someone else? What role will you play? I think the, uh, the answer to that is that we're uh, trying to stimulate others. We're not interested in, uh, you know, building a building or having a, uh, you know, a city park named for us. Scott actually has a, an interest that's distinguished Massachusetts <laughs> name for him. That's, that's impressive. I, I, I never let Scott forget this. Uh, I'm <laughs> jealous of that. Uh, but no, no, we're not interested in building something that's going to exist uh, five years from now or four years from now. God willing, we won't need lawyers defending American democracy that far down the road. If we can be vocal and just light a fire under people, specifically under lawyers, because, because then I mean the bar, uh, to get them motivated, to uh, get them to shave off a little bit of that, those billable hours, and spend it on writing an op-ed. Uh, doing shows like this, Jay, uh, uh, you know, appearing in Congress, even going to a demonstration. Years ago, when I was still practicing in Washington, I remember the then whoever was the dictator of Pakistan at the time fired the chief justice. His name was Chowdhury. And a right. whole lot of right. lawyers showed up in Washington. You know, the Washington Bar showed up on Capitol Hill. It was a nice day uh, for a demonstration in support of some guy in Pakistan. The Chief Justice in Pakistan. Uh, well, you know, where are the lawyers now? I, I personally think the lawyers should be out in the street. Uh, it's not going to happen on May 1st, which is uh, law day as well as May day. Uh, maybe it'll happen in September when Constitution Day falls on the 17th. Uh, lawyers have got to show up and uh, dedicate some of their time, you know, there's only 24 hours in a day. You can't build 24 hours a day. Give us an hour. Yep. Give us half an hour. Yep. Hand these cards out. Hand these little cards out. Your cards, yes. And the box. <laughs> hand them out. And you know what? The lawyers that you hand those cards to, they're going to say, send me some more. I want to give them to all my friends, uh, you know, in court. Uh, or to the next state trooper that stops me. And you can find out you can find out more about lawyers defending American democracy on the website lawyers defending American democracy dot org. Scott, let's give you a moment to close and see how much of what Gene said you agree with. Well, look, I, I, first of all, I will uh, say that one of the, the, the great pleasures for me has been to reconnect even at this uh, age with some of my uh, uh, friends and classmates and people like Gene who had distinguished careers, and I say that. Uh, not in any way to be totally uh, uh, obsequious, but it just is true. And what we sat here and said, look, our time has come. And suddenly we looked at each other and said, but where, who are the successors? If nothing else, one of our jobs is, to, what our roles, I hope, is to try to remind people of the core principles that while we don't always adhere to them, that we felt were important, whether we were, whether we were in public sector law, public interest law, academic law, law reform law, law firms at local levels, but the core principles that the Lawyers Vietnam Committee, the Lawyers Against the Boys, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, the Lawyers Committee for Economic Justice was about, not about a partisan position, but it was lawyers speaking to core principles and speaking as lawyers, as an independent profession. And I believe that this, that is my hope is that the John Gardner line is when you when you're dealing with citizen activism, you don't need fifty percent. You need one percent. You need one percent of the leaders to mobilize the others around various kinds of common causes. And for me, what I am surprised about but hopeful about is that we have a chance to remind lawyers what our common principles are as lawyers. Uh, to stand and defend 
the core values of and core principles of the law and our democracy and what is at stake. We are not, we do not win just because we're lawyers. But what is interesting is, I believe to this day, that one of the surprises for most people is when they do attack the rule of law, when they do attack the judiciary, it's when they don't get pushback from the independent bar, they are surprised. Mm. And then they know there are no bounds. They mm. expect to get partisan pushback. But where is the independent center, Jay? And I agree with Gene totally in this respect. Efforts like yours, is my, maybe they're small, but one by one, I am hopeful that we can manage to get an institutional change in bar associations so that the bar stands up and speaks to these issues uh, consistently. Um, but it's not going to happen overnight, and I just I think that the idea that we try to do this one person at a time, as strange as that seems, is one that um, I hope is going to be very successful. We have to figure a way to let people know and to empower lawyers to speak out and to act. Amen and to that. Sign up. That's now it's a common sign up and join us, and we welcome your ideas, your perspectives, and we welcome most of all your energy. Thank you, Scott Harshberger and Gene Fidel, for this very interesting conversation. I hope we can do it again, and I wish you well on the project, and I and I will particip participate myself, because I really believe what you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jay, very much for having us. I appreciate it. And I'm honored to be on with Professor Fidel, <laughs> even though he is from Yale. <laughs> and there's only one thing. There's only one thing I want to say, Jay. Mahalo. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo to you guys and aloha. <laughs> Thank you all. Great. Thank you. Thanks,